Well, howdy doody, everybody. My name is Cowboy Jason DaCosta, and this is Cowboy Consistent Preterism. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Hebrews chapter 9, <clears throat> one of the places that the whizzy whizzy wannabes like to go. But before I did that, I wanted to just give a shout out to myself and the other three men that were in my uh, squares pool for the NCAA tournament. We hit on a square last night. Unfortunately, it was only a $250 square divided by four. Basically gets you, I don't know, a couple cheese pizzas. But, but when you enjoy gambling on sporting events, and it's not an addiction, you know, I do enjoy it though. It's kind of fun. It brings a different um, perspective of fun to the games themselves. But when you uh, win, it's just nice. It's nice to win. So it's really not about the, the money, right, when you're talking that amount. Although it's, you know, a couple hundred bucks, it's nice. But it's more about just saying that you won. So I'm waking up today looking at the score of that Michigan-Texas Tech game last night and realizing that we hit a square. So hopefully many more to come. Anyways, we're going to get right into it, folks. We're going to get into Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 23 to 28. Now, the focus of this teaching is perspective, right? And what we're looking at something from, right? With our preconceived notions and our assumptions and everything that we've been force-fed over the years to believe. And when you just change the perspective just a little bit, right? Just a degree or two, and you look at it from a different angle, it all makes sense, right? I mean, for instance, You can look at something like, uh, they are not all Israel who are of Israel, right? And from the wannabe perspective, that means that there's true Israelites, you know, within the pagan country. Uh, I shouldn't say it that way because that's a little tricky. To a wannabe, that means that Gentiles were true Israelites. Like the, the literal pagan Gentiles who never had any connection to God could become true Israelites by faith. But when you understand the story, you know that <clears throat> all that Paul is saying there when he says not all Israel is Israel, or however he words it, is that not all who professed to be Israel were Israel. It still doesn't extend outside of the context of Israel as a whole. It was a remnant of Israel within Israel, and Paul also referred to them as the true Israel of God. So perspective is huge, right? Another one is Galatians 3, where it says... Uh, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek or Jew or Gentile. If you're Abraham, I'm sorry, if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and an heir according to promise. Now, wannabes look at that and they say, see, look, if you have faith, it makes you Abraham's seed and an heir according to promise, right? No, that's not what it says. If you change the perspective on it and understand it in light of what it's actually saying, you understand that it's saying, if you are Christ's, it's because you are Abraham's seed and an heir, according to promise, okay? In other words, didn't matter if they were Jew or Gentile, didn't matter if they were slave or free. If they were Abraham's seed, they were an heir according to promise, and by golly, they were getting that promise. God was having mercy upon them out in the nations. So, perspective. Now, keep that in mind as I read here. It says in verse 23 of Hebrews 9, Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Excuse me. So first thing to take note of here is the uh, heaven itself reference, right? Christ entered into heaven itself. Now, there's been some um, objections to the I.O. position that say, oh, you know, the Jesus didn't really go up into heaven in Acts chapter 1, was it? He didn't really ascend up into heaven. That's just metaphor. Well, then where the hell did he go? They watched him go up into the cloud and he vanished from their presence bodily and they never saw his body again until he supposedly returned for them, right? But the thing to take note of is he actually didn't enter into any temple or anything. He entered into heaven itself. All right, and he appeared in the presence of God for them. He, it says for us. Now we always take notice of these words, us, you, them, they. But now, you know, you kind of just 
pick and choose as an inconsistent full prey. Oh, this, this is us, right? He's appearing in heaven for us. Yet the other us in the other passage, oh, that's first century, you know, Israelites. So we have to be more consistent <clears throat> with the audience relevance. So he appeared in heaven for us. And then it goes on in verse 25 and it says, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Wow. Look at what that just says, folks. And I'm going to explain it to you if you didn't catch it. It's all about perspective, right? People like to say that Christ appeared. Well, we'll go from the inconsistent full prep position. They say Christ appeared at the end of the days. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself for all eternity, right? For every single person going forward, for all eternity, going forward in the future, all generations of people coming, that's exactly who he put away sin for, right? But look at what it says, verse 25 again. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. <clears throat> but now once at the end of the ages, he put, put it away by the sacrifice of himself. So he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. So where's the futuristic tone to this, right? The author is essentially saying that if, if that were the case, Christ would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. In other words, his, his death or his dying was applicable to those in context going backwards since to the foundation of the world. I hope that makes sense. And he, he caps it off and says, but now he has appeared once at the end of the age. Right? And it says ages, but it's actually just age in the original. He says he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So the sacrifice of death, I'm um, sorry, the sacrifice of Christ's death at the end of the age was a one-time deal to deal with with sins committed prior that went all the way back to the foundation of the world. And obviously, if you've listened to me, you know that was the foundation of the covenant people. That was the creation of Israel. Israel was his creation. The world was those under the law. And, I, and actually, if you, if you really want to get technical, he knew who, who the elect were. He always did. That's what Jacob and Esau represent. He loved Jacob before he did anything good or bad in the womb. So he had his elect, he had his chosen. And in Acts 13, Paul even says that even the Gentiles were chosen. Even the Gentiles, the ones out in the nations, yeah, they were elect, they were chosen. So this had nothing to do with, um, you know, some kind of, oh, I, I think I'm going to receive the Holy Spirit today. Just, you know, the weather's nice, the sun's out. Yeah, it's a good day to receive the Holy Spirit. I'll make that choice and receive it. Wrong. This was a mission to go out and seek and save the elect. He would not lose one. He knew where they were. His sheep would hear his voice. He sent his fishermen out to fish them out. They were called out from all nations. And Paul in Acts 13 puts the nail, puts the hammer to the head of the nail and says, all those Gentiles who were, who were appointed to eternal life believed. So even the Gentiles were appointed to eternal life, which takes the whole argument of a conscious decision for Christ right off the table. There is no conscious decision for Christ. None whatsoever. Calvinism? <laughs> yeah, on steroids. Because that's exactly what the Bible teaches. The only problem is, it doesn't go beyond the coming of the Lord. So, we have Christ's death applicable for those going backwards in time to the creation of the world. doesn't say anything about Christ's death going forward in time. It says he's appeared once at the end of the age to deal with sin and if he didn't and if it was based on blood he would have had to suffer repeatedly over and over again all the way back to the foundation of the world is what it says all right now that kind of says that the law was there all the way since the beginning as well if you think about it because christ was the end of the law he died in place of the law and the creation of the world seems to be the beginning of the law the beginning of that relationship between god and his people but let's continue he says in verse 27, And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered to so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Now, 
the whole point of what he's saying here is on the once, right? It says, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. In other words, men will die once, Christ died once to bear the sins of those men who would die once because they had to stand at the future judgment. Now, people read that and think that this is an individual deal where the author is saying it's appointed for men to die once and then comes the judgment. <clears throat> nope. There is no concept of uh, ongoing, repeated billion upon billions of judgments in this scripture. There's one final judgment when collectively the body of covenant ones or collectively the, the, the body, the corporate body, would rise and stand before the throne and be judged. And then he would split the sheep from the goat. So there is no individual judgment mentioned in this story. This is a corporate resurrection. This is a corporate judgment. And it says, and it is appointed for man to, men to die once, but after this, the judgment. In other words, but after that, the final judgment. They'd be raised and rise to the final judgment. Now, remember, I believe that he's going back, probably just like he just did, to the beginning of the foundation of the covenant world, saying it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. They knew they were going to rise and stand before the judgment. Daniel chapter 12 shows who that was. That was Israel. Daniel, your people shall rise and stand before the throne, and the books will be opened. This was all about Israel. Jesus said in the age to come, the 12 apostles would sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The age to come, the judgment, the resurrection, the books, the inheritance was all for Israel. Romans 9, 1 to 4. Even the adoption belonged to Israel. People say, no, 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 pagans were adopted. Wrong. Go read Romans 9, 1 to 4 and educate yourself. Because the adoption even belonged to Israel. So, it says it is appointed for men to die once. The men in context is Israel. Heck, it's a book called Hebrews. <laughs> It's all about the Hebrew people. If you can't pick that up, I don't know what you're reading. It's a law book. It's all about their law. It's about sacrifices. It's about the better sacrifice. It's about Christ replacing the Levitical priesthood and on and on and on and on. It's all about Israel. And so it is appointed for men, Israel, the covenant people, to die once. But after this, the final judgment that only Israel had. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. The context and the focus is on the once men would die once and in the same way Christ was only offered once to bear the sins of many okay and then he says to those who eagerly wait for him he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation now I don't know about you folks but that's pretty clear all this judgment talk all this you know receiving an inheritance talk all this you know foundation of the world and Christ appeared to put away sin stuff clearly wraps up when he appears a second time apart from sin for salvation. That's when it all would come to an end. He's very clear here. He says, this whole, this whole stuff, all this stuff that I just got done talking about, he says, it's all relevant to those who eagerly wait for him when he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So, you know, Don Preston and the boys, they like to say that that just means he'd appear a second time apart from sin for salvation for everybody in the future who believes. No, the truth is, this is a riding off into the sunset, happy ending, not the tudala happy ending, but the happy ending that you expect at every story like this, right? That the Savior comes for them, apart from sin, for salvation, he calls them up, they ride off into the sunset, and they're saved, right? That's, that's what's really going on here. That's the conclusion. And that's why the gospel went to all nations and then the end would come, said Jesus in Matthew 24, 14. That's why all the Israelites were saved by the coming of Jacob's Redeemer. And that included the fullness of the ones in the nations, according to Romans 12, uh, 11. So it all wraps up at the coming. And those who eagerly waited for him, for that coming that he said would occur before some standing there died, he would appear to them apart from sin, for their salvation. So again, the focus here is on perspective, folks. If you change your perspective, you can understand why everything that Christ did at the end of the age had a prior application, right? It, it applied to those prior. Because he, he says right here, if this was the case, Christ would have had to been repeatedly sacrificed over and over again, all the way back to the foundation of the world. So it's got a prior application. 
all right? And uh, the judgment has nothing to do with individual judgments. I mean, I can't believe I still have to argue this with some people. And I'm not calling anybody out. You know, I had a, a nice guy ask that question recently. It's, this has nothing to do with that, although that did spark some recent discussions I've had with wannabes, um, or bring to remembrance, I should say, because they just don't get it. This is a corporate final judgment. This is not an individual uh, final judgment. Every single seven billion humans dying and standing immediately before a throne. That's not what the Bible teaches. This is a corporate judgment where your people, Daniel, will rise and stand before the throne and be judged. And then they would be separated, the sheep from the goats. All right. So, yeah, folks, that's about all I got today. I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope you all have a wonderful day. And we'll be back another day, another time, another place, and another rhyme. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.